Well, morning. You might not think good. You might think, wow, pastor, you're so emo this morning. What's going on? Right? Well, if you don't know what emo is, ask someone who's less than 30, maybe. But it's, as we come out of this pandemic, I want to talk about a subject that's going to come up. You're not going to feel okay sometimes. There are going to be people around you who are going to ask, or you might see someone who's not feeling happy and glad and as joyous as they, we should as we get back to life as it was, sort of, right? The pandemic is slowly fading, and we're supposed to, as we can gather together, feel good, feel happy. And people are going to say, why aren't you okay? Why aren't you feeling good? And I've got to tell you, first and foremost, even when all of your circumstances around you might feel or look like to the outside world, like everything is not just good, but great, sometimes you don't feel okay. Look at David here in Psalm 22, the beloved of God. He quite literally was the beloved of God. He was a king. He had talent. He was an incredible musician, warrior, really good looking. Really good looking. Come on, if you'd been today, he'd been on, you know, he'd be a star. But here he begins a phrase we hear again from Christ on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, Christ said those words right before he died. In fact, this verse is so felt by so many in the New Testament, it's one of the most quoted psalms. 24 different times. This really, really poignant, crying psalm, this lament. Isn't that a great word, a lament? It's talked about, quoted in, this, in, the, in the scripture. Because David understood that it's sometimes we just don't feel good. Sometimes we feel alone, even in a crowd. You feel like that? You stand there and everyone around you doesn't get you or feels like they don't get you. Even in your family, sometimes people don't understand. Psalm 22 deals with that, the feeling with it's hurts. Life is hard. You know, David writes this, this psalm about how he's living when his ex felt experiences in his life aren't matching how he's supposed to feel in his faith. How it's not matching what people around him are saying. How it's not matching up with what's going on. David was dealing with something that I call one of the, one of the most pernicious distortions of theology ever. I call it a heretical belief. It's called, well, I call it, you must have done something wrong to get cursed this way by God syndrome. You know? It has, it address, you, you can also dress it up the other way. The idea is if you are in God's favor, if you've done everything right, if you're living the faith, if you really believe well enough or hard enough, then your life is going to be fabulous. In fact, there are entire mega churches, particularly one in Houston, we can talk about this later, built on the idea if your faith is good enough, God wants you to be rich and famous and wealthy in all ways and have a great looking husband or wife and two and a half perfect little children who grew up with the perfect little people who are just like you and healthy and wise. If you have good faith, God wants you to drive a Porsche, you know, whatever, okay? 
It's called prosperity gospel, and I got to tell you, it's a lie. It's a lie. And because it, the converse, the flip side is, if you have a bad faith, if your life is full of trials and pain, death and destruction, tragedy, then you must have done something to earn that. And so when people saw David's life, the death of his son, the betrayal by family, the, the, all the other sin, all the other you know, stuff in his life, the death of his best friend, they must, they must have been whispering behind his back and saying, he did something bad, didn't he? He must not be right with God. And we see it today. But faithful people have hard times. Faithful people, in fact, have hardships. One of my heroes, I have a journalism degree, and when I was younger, I thought I might be a journalist. And uh, Ter- one of my heroes was Terry Anderson, a Christian journalist kidnapped in the Middle East. You might have heard about him. Imprisoned and captured and tortured for years. What did he do wrong? Nothing. He's a good guy. Oh, there's this other woman you might have heard of who felt bereft of God, didn't feel the presence of God for most of her life. We know her really well as Mother Teresa. If you read her journals, you see the anguish she felt because she didn't feel the presence of God. So it's not you. The first thing you have to understand and what, what David teaches us about these situations, it's okay not to feel okay. We all go through it. In fact, uh, <clears throat> earlier in the year, when I first ga- came here, we read a great book about the dark, tea time, dark time of the soul. All, well, not all, but many of the greatest spiritual heroes went through this time of bereavement when it didn't feel good, when it didn't feel right. It's okay. And when other people say, you must have done something wrong, they're wrong. i got to tell you, as your pastor and from Scripture, it doesn't work that way. I love the quote, and you might ask me, why does this happen, Pastor? What is the purpose of these dark times in our lives? There are many, but one of the most important ones I love was put out by, this, uh, by Rick Warren, who's a pastor down here, you might have heard of him, um, And he said, the time our faith grows the most is when we feel God the least. When we choose to have faith because we choose just as he chose us. And so how do we do it? Well, if we only had the first 21 verses of this psalm, I couldn't tell you, but we have more verses. So let me read some more verses to you from Psalm 22 through 25. I will declare your name to my people in the assembly. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel, for he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to the cry for his cry for help. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. For those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. So the first thing to do to build our strength in God, to build the strength to survive these things, is to praise God for what he's done for us. Remember how God has been faithful. Remember what brought you to faith in the first place and cemented that faith for you in the beginning. So many of us are people of the now, right? You know, I'm one of the most impatient people you will ever meet. It hurts to wait 30 seconds for my computer finally to turn on, okay? The most wonderful gift I got from Apple was a computer that would turn on instantly or close enough. It's Hard to see beyond the immediate. To remember what's gone in the past, especially when it hurts. 
I'm trying to lose weight and get in better condition. One of the ways I'm encouraging myself is to remember what it's like not to carry an extra person around my waist, you know? <laughs> to remember what it felt like to be faster and lighter on my feet. I remember. In the same way, if we remember the great things God has done for us, it helps us have the foundation to persevere in that moment. The pain will pass. It will get better. Our time on earth is just a sliver of eternity with God. It's hard to remember that. I'll share with you because I'm, you guys aren't on HIPAA. Right now, I am suffering with learning how to live with a CPAP. It's not simply slapping it on your face and getting on with life. It's not fun. And I've almost used a word I shouldn't in church, actually, because how little fun it is. But two things. One is the guarantee from a doctor I trust and people I trust that if I can get this CPAP to work, my life will be much better health-wise, energy-wise. I might even have to be able to cut down, though I don't know why I'd want to cut down, on the coffee consumption during the day. But it will, because I trust these people and their experience. And that's the second thing. We find strength, not just in the memory of what's gone before, but in the community that we build up around us, especially a community of faith. I trust my doctors. I trust my friends, especially the Christian doctors who are my friends, when they tell me things, both as a Christian brother and as a friend, to help me. I trust my Christian counselors, because I've added one of those to my life. Because you know what? P pastors need somewhere to go where they can just vent to. And that helps me. Having you guys in my life helps me. Being able to call people like Emily and just be happier after the conversation, even if it's just about church stuff. Or Janet, we can talk, or Paul, talk about music. That helps me. Hey, I even look forward to meetings because I get to see people I like. I haven't been here long enough not to dislike anybody in the church. It's a good feeling. <laughs> oh, it's a great feeling. No, I really don't. You know, even the people that are, as a, a, I'll steal another phrase from Rick Warren, extra grace required individuals, I love them too. Because this is my community, and you help me. And we help each other. And that's what, G, that's what, David is saying, praise God for what he's done. Praise him and praise him in the assembly. Praise him with other people. Joy shared is joy multiplied. And pain shared is pain, you know, divided. We support each other. We lift each other. It helps. And finally, finally, look to the future. Look to the future for hope. Being a community not just is helpful, but it doesn't cure everything that's going on. Being with friends doesn't help completely. Heck, my coaching for my CPATH helps, but it doesn't make the next two or three weeks more fun. It just helps. But I see a month out. I see a hope at the end of the tunnel where I'm better and I can put that mask on and feel okay. I'm better to see the end of the pandemic where we're all back to not normal, but a little bit better. In fact, I'm looking for a better normal where people actually wash their hands after going to the bathroom, you know? I'm looking for better where my children don't bring home flus and other things because we sanitize better. I'm looking for better where we have a lot more expansive worldview of what's needed around us because all of the underlying conditions that were there have come to the top because of the stress we've been under the pandemic. 
I never wanted this pandemic, but you know what? There's some good things that are going to come out of it in the end. But, and I see that future for us and for this community too. You guys have been through a ton during these last year and a half, two years almost. But I've got hope for the future where we make a bigger and better God-sized impact on our communities. I have a hope for the future that doesn't stop at the edges of our property or at the edges of our lives. I have a hope that empowered by God's Spirit, we are a community that not just is healthier, but more vibrant and makes an impact in everything we do. I have a hope that David describes in Psalm 22, 26 through 31. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord in all the families of the nations. will bow down before him. For the dominion belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. All the riches of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive. Prosperity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to the people yet unborn, he has done it. That's the future. That's the promise. That's what we have to look forward to. That's how we survive the not-so-great times, the awful, ugly times. And we do it together. We do it as a body. We travel those dark, ugly times, and we walk them together. You know, one of the psalms I didn't pick for this series is Psalm 23. Because, well, I'm not sure how many times you guys have heard sermons on Psalm 23. But one of the favorite things for me is that I draw from Psalm 23 is from a sermon years ago. And it's a, just a simple question. How do we get through the valley of death? You walk. You keep moving. And you keep moving with God. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Why don't I fear? His rod, his shield. It still stinks that we're in the valley of death. It still stinks that my friend died. It still stinks that I lost my job. It still hurts that my, my hand, my back, my whatever is in, you know, is, it's still not fun to find out that you've got cancer. It's still not fun to find out i got to work at breathing through a machine at night. But you know what? God is here. God will carry you. And God is in this community to help you today and for every day. But we just have to engage that community. I'm glad you're here because that's part of it, whether you're online or whether you're here in person. That's all part of the deal and it's great. It's wonderful, it's joyous, but it's not always going to be okay. And that's okay too. Let's go to God and thank him. Let's pray. Oh precious Father, I thank you this morning. We all do. That you are here with us. That you allow us to persevere in the face of great trial that you loved us enough even when life is no much, no fun. And you give us a hope that David talks about, even as he faced so many trials, even as he suffered, he had hope, Lord. Help us to take the lessons from his life, his ministry, and bless us today, we pray. Amen.